to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. Uh, my name is Camden Busey, and I'm here again in Escondido, California, at Westminster Seminary, California, on our series of interviews. Uh, this is number three in the order uh, that we've uh, scheduled out, and I'm delighted to be here, very privileged to be here, and looking forward now to speak uh, on the program for the very first time with Dr. Steve Baugh, who is Professor of New Testament here at Westminster Seminary, California, and a minister in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Welcome, Steve. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's great to be here. I, I've been enjoying my week. Uh, the conference was tremendous. I appreciated your talk on Hebrews and uh, looking at... Uh, the text deeply there and learning some new things that I that I uh, hadn't picked up on before. But it's been a tremendous privilege to, to meet you and to get to speak with you today. Thank you. Well, um, we're, we could talk about all sorts of things. I, and one thing I do at least want to mention uh, for the people is uh, your commentary in Ephesians, which is with the uh, Evangelical Exegetical Commentary Series. It's published uh, through Lexham. That was back in 2015. It's a tremendous uh, volume. You can get that uh, in print. You can also get it through the Logos system, which is how I have it. Um, and then it's all tagged and everything and integrated with um, all the other resources in your library and with the Bibles. It's really convenient. And I guess they keep it updated too if there's ever new things that need to be added or illustrations and whatnot. That's at least how they promote. <laughs> I don't know how they talk to the authors about this thing, but at least when they're promoting the book, they say, you know, an update's possibly to come in the future. Um, but today we're going to be speaking about uh, the book, The Majesty on High, an introduction to the kingdom of God in the New Testament. This was published just a few years ago in 2017 uh, through CreateSpace, uh, and it's available uh, very easily at uh, Amazon.com. I think they also have copies in the seminary uh, bookstore here and uh, at other places. And uh, I got my copy not too long ago and worked through it, and we're going to be speaking about that today. It's also but, on Kindle. Yeah, it is. Yeah, of course. Yeah, through through Amazon and CreateSpace, a very convenient way to, to get books that way. Now, you you write off in the beginning of this book on the kingdom of God that you had finished a book that took you a long time to write, and that this uh, is a book in which you decided to write a, a fun book that you wanted to write. Was the commentary the one before? Yes, it? the commentary <laughs> was very in very engrossing, very demanding. Mm -hmm. uh, I was working during a study leave ten to. 12 hours a day mm. on the commentary and it took five years to write, but it really was a lot more research I've done since the eighties mm -hmm. really for my doctoral work that came in, that fueled some of the background stuff. Well, we have the time to, you know, tell us a bit about the, the Ephesians project before we move into the kingdom of God and just your particular um, perspective and take on Ephesians and what you bring. That's, that's a contribution because I think it's a, it's a tremendous addition but uh, how is this commentary uh, a little bit different from the other ones that have been out there? Well, um, many commentaries today specialize in engaging in scholarly dialogue with particularly the last 10, 15 years of scholarly dialogue. And mm -hmm. so you'll get a lot of interaction with contemporary scholars in a commentary, which for a pastor can be mm -hmm. not the first thing they're looking for. Maybe some help on that, but not everything. Um, so I decided to do my, what I do. Uh, mm -hmm. So my doctorate's on Ephesus. Mm -hmm. So the city of Ephesus, historical background in Paul. So I brought in some of that with uh, documents, uh, inscriptional documents, illuminating background that haven't been translated before. So I provide a translation of some of this material, for example, on adoption, you know, what it meant to a first century Ephesian for Paul to talk about adoption. Mm -hmm. it, it isn't really what we think of adoption, first mm -hmm. of all. Uh, and so some of the background stuff is from all that work mm -hmm. over the years. And then uh, I've taught Greek for a long time. I studied Greek, I started studying Greek in 1977 in classics, where I do have a, my second degree is in classics, so I've read a lot of Greek in different phases and such. And some of that work actually came up in my mind as I was working on Ephesians and helping people read Greek like a first century person mm -hmm. and someone who, uh, you know, hears Greek the way you would hear it back then. So the way I organize the text is more of a natural uh, way of organizing the text. The versification is 
helpful for cross-referencing, but not necessarily for the native structuring of the text. Sometimes it's not helpful. Mm. Uh, so I was trying to offer that. Those are probably the two main things. There's some other things I've done over the years I try to contribute, but the I guess the final thing is Reformed theology, which still excites me. And, you know, the gospel is our life. It's our lifeblood. It, it, it's... <laughs> Who can't read Ephesians and get excited about the gospel? I mean, Christ and his glory. And uh, <laughs> so I was excited. I mean, that that was part of it. So I, I wrote uh, the study notes for a study Bible, mm -hmm. uh, ESV study Bible on Ephesians. And that that's the first thing that got me going. I, mm -hmm. I wrote that and I thought, man, this is, this is so much fun. This is so edifying. I was just tremendously edified that at the end of it, I thought, if I'm ever going to write a commentary, it would be on Ephesians. I just want to get into it more, mm -hmm. just the details of this glorious little book. So that's why I did it. Yeah, it is a tremendous book. And our regional home missionary, Jim Bosgraf, who's just now retired, he would always start um, a new mission work with a Bible study on Ephesians. Oh, that's interesting. Just how foundational it was and yeah. how useful it is to establish a lot of basic categories and the glory of God and the doctrine of the church and... All the, everything. It's a wonderful book. Um, speaking of, of uh, that, um, certainly we see Christ reigning and ruling in the book of Ephesians, and we see us as uh, his people united to him, uh, seated with him in heavenly places. And, um, you know, we definitely have a lot of uh, kingdom of God themes in there, maybe not as explicit I don't, you know, the language of, of kingdom perhaps as much as we see it in the Gospels or in Revelation as some other places. But the kingdom of God certainly is a dominant theme throughout the entire Bible, even in the Old Testament. And that's something I really appreciate about this book, The Majesty on High, which is an introduction to the kingdom of God in the New Testament. But you are looking through all of Scripture and uh, developing themes and tracing them there. But um, th th speak to us a bit about how this... Um, is a bit different. How how this is the fun book <laughs> after after the commentary. <laughs> well, it's a fun book because I didn't worry about any footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't interact with a lot of other people. Um, I have read a lot of other people and a lot of, a lot of other views, but I'm not critiquing anybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, some of our better uh, reformed authors will do that at times where they're really just writing more positively what the scripture is saying. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do that. I don't get a chance to do that much in my mm -hmm. academic writing. Mm -hmm. If you're writing a journal article, you have to engage with all the scholarship and, you know, all of that, which is fine. It's just a, a whole different uh, exercise. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do something which for me, I could move more to a popular level, I guess mm -hmm. I call it and not worry about footnotes. There's no Greek font in it at all, although it's from the Greek text. There are times when I'll do my own translation. Mm -hmm. But I just really wanted something more popular. I, I have to admit, I this is a confession. I've taught on this at our seminary. It's a unit in our Gospels class, the Kingdom of God. So I have a couple week unit on it and I begin by asking the students so what is the kingdom of God yeah, it's my and, next question <laughs> and, and I often get these puzzled looks right. in response right it seems very vague to us uh -huh. uh, I had that experience myself so what is the kingdom of God well you know it's Christ mm -hmm. in my heart it's you know it's you know in process you know some scholars define it as God's ruling activity you know mm -hmm as if he hasn't been ruling the creation so far. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted, so in my class, I have a very simple presentation of what it is. Mm -hmm. So to start out with the question, what is the kingdom of God? I wanted to answer it in a very simple, direct way. And that's what this book really is about. It's a very simple presentation of what the kingdom of God is, but their implications. So that's where it gets fun. And you have to make distinctions. You have to start thinking about it. It's how it's presently mm -hmm. 
been manifested and inaugurated and then how it will be consummated at the end of the age. And frankly, there's a lot more to say about it. This yeah. is just a very quick introduction, as well as being very standard. There's, if you read Reformed theologians on the kingdom of God, they're going to say the same thing. Mm -hmm. They just add so, many, so much other stuff that it can sound complicated. So I wanted to make it simple. And yeah, correct. and then also, therefore, accessible to many other people, yeah. too. Look, I love uh, Voss, or, uh, Ritter Boss's The Coming of the Kingdom, but that's right. not a book I yeah. can necessarily hand to people in my congregation. <laughs> yeah, uh, Many of them could get through it, but uh, it's it would be a challenge. I, I love how you start, and you just provide kind of a two-layered definition. There's a simple definition in which you say the kingdom of God is the new creation. Like it just reorients us and says, wow, it really gets us, I think, thinking in the right mode. But then you expand that, and um, I'm quoting you here, the kingdom of God proper is the fully eschatological new heavens and new earth inhabited by the redeemed, resurrected saints in glory and incorruptibility where the triune God triumphantly rules supreme in the presence of his people forever. So that adds some dimension that we see how the kingdom can always be, but at the same time, uh, the kingdom can still come. And there, there's all these other dimensions, and you start to, to parse many of those out when you start to uh, list the constituent elements of the kingdom. We have the king, a ruling power, ruling authority and dominion, the realm, the kingdom subjects or the citizens, and then covenant as kingdom constitution. These, these categories are just tremendously useful. How do, how do all these kind of looking at things through those lenses or uh, how does that help us get a more perhaps biblical understanding of the kingdom rather than other approaches, dispensational or you name it? Yeah, well, getting into dispensational views would take all of our time. <laughs> they're, they're actually puzzling about this now. They're not. They're, it, they're no longer united on this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. And so there are different groups who have different notions. One group called progressive dispensationalists who right. are closer to what we're talking about. Um, and by the way, you, I, I do bring it in sometimes. Uh, the Westminster Standards actually have these. This is the teaching of the Westminster Standards. Um, it talks about, for example, the, the kingdom of grace and the kingdom of glory. Mm -hmm. But it's just a a distinction of phases of the one kingdom and not mm -hmm. two different kingdoms. Um, so the distinctions of king, uh, dominion with two meanings, uh, citizens, part of that is you can see how the, the kingdom of God has been inaugurated in different ways. That's the key. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is most helpful here is People often talk about the kingdom as already and not yet and don't make distinctions. And I think those distinctions are vital. Mm -hmm. and, and the result of this has to be adding clarity to your reading of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. You can clarify now and say, okay, Christ has assumed his rule at the right hand of his father that is eternal, that's new in the new covenant era. That is new. And it's because Christ as Son of God incarnate, that's what's new, is mm -hmm. you have a God-man. And so you have a human being now at mm -hmm. the right hand of the Father ruling forever. Now the original creation has been brought into its um, goal and consummation in him implicit. Mm -hmm. But we don't see that of us. We don't see us yet entered into that state until the end of the age. Right. And the new creation begins in a new phase, mm -hmm. but it's been started. It's been implanted um, and inaugurated. So it helps you see ways in which the kingdom has been inaugurated and yet still needs to be consummated. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing in that whole distinction is covenant. We don't normally bring covenant into discussion with kingdom, but I think we should. We talk about Reformed theology being covenant theology, we're kingdom theologians as well, mm -hmm. and because the two work together, they're yeah, Second Samuel seven is a good yeah, example. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, that's the that's the proof in the pudding, isn't uh -huh. it? Where you start thinking, oh yeah, this text and this text that all connects with what we're talking about. That's to me the exciting mm -hmm. thing about these bigger 
issues mm-hmm. is they help clarify scripture for you. So you're mm-hmm. working now with what's going on. So when Jesus comes announce, John comes announcing the nearness of the kingdom of God, Jesus the nearness of the kingdom of God, you know what they're talking about, the mm-hmm. new creation. But how? What's he up to? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to be speaking. Uh, I will be speaking then not too, not too long from now with um, Dr. Estelle about Exodus. And of course, that's another enormous motif throughout all of Scripture. But it is it is wonderful when you see all these different themes and motifs uh, organically connected and and bringing fuller light and, and even depth to our understanding of what God has done and is doing for us. Um, and language of inauguration is useful, and you did also mention just briefly the language of already not yet. Though in the book, you do describe at least your inclination to prefer inaugurated uh, as to already not yet. Is that merely because people don't make all necessary distinctions with yeah. already not yet? That's right. There's it's, some liabilities, maybe. Already not yet is common in dispensational mm-hmm. d- uh, discussion. And they're, it, you know, these are these are people we can appreciate as brothers and sisters in the Lord. But Amen. Yeah. it's a different view. And in, in the end of the day, when you're talking about the kingdom of God being up an earthly thousand year reign mm-hmm. after the second coming before the new creation. See, we're, we're not saying that. Mm-hmm. And, and so for them, consummation is really a millennial reign on earth. And that's different from mm-hmm. what we're talking about. So I, I simply wanted to distinguish between that because I think it just, it's used so much mm-hmm. that, that people um, have kind of a vague view when they hear it and I wanted to provide a new way of talking about it that you don't have preconceptions that we have to get over. Yeah. That's all. No, that's great. I think that's really useful. Um, you also bring out the theme of organic development and that's something we speak about on Reform Forum an awful lot as we're, we very much are indebted to Gerhardus Voss, his portrait on the wall. Yeah. Look, he's looking down <laughs> upon us. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the thinking about that is helpful. How how can we see the kingdom advancing organically through Scripture too, rather than it just being something that's uh, somehow appended to the end? Uh, how do we see it even from the early pages of the Bible and then coming, developing all the way through? My, we're going to have a lot more fun now, um, because you really start with Genesis. Yeah, uh, the kingdom is. The new creation is what's held out to Adam in the promise of life upon perfect personal obedience to the law, which he failed in. But the kingdom is the goal originally, and it's never abandoned. I mean, God could have abandoned it and right. executed judgment immediately after the right. fall on Adam and Eve. It would have been just. To do yeah, so. it would have been mm-hmm. just, and there would have been no mm-hmm. gospel, there would have been no continuing mm-hmm. of the human race. But in the fact that he withheld judgment while judging, but offered hope that he would intervene and bring in the destruction of Satan's usurpation, mm-hmm. now we have the kingdom of God put it in another realm that somebody else has to accomplish it. Mm-hmm. Which is why when the second Adam, our Lord Jesus, comes, mm-hmm. he it's kingdom of God. So it's not new in that sense. It's really what was held out to Adam. Then you have in types, so picture language through the Old Testament, you have types of it. The most obvious one is the, I won't anticipate my brother and colleagues statements but you have the you have the exodus Mm -hmm. into the promised land which is the kingdom i mean it's a portrait of the kingdom kingdom realm Mm -hmm. so it's really everywhere you have the the presentation of christ as king through the davidic king kingdom Mm -hmm. and kingship uh the high priesthood you have a picture of christ's high priesthood that inaugurates the kingdom definitively by bringing a new covenant sacrifice uh, in Melchizedek, and then picked up in the Levitical priesthood in portraiture. Mm-hmm. So it's throughout the scripture. This is not new, but it is new in the new covenant in Christ bringing it in because now you have the reality. We're not really picturing it in shadowy form anymore. We're seeing the reality of it. Yeah. That's very uh, a helpful way to, to, to put it. I love how our standards speak about uh, the covenant of grace and its 
two main basic administrations, mm-hmm. you know, Old Covenant, New Covenant, yeah. and then how it was previously, the, the same grace, the same substance, that of our risen Lord, was administered previously in promises, types, sacrifices, shadowy forms. You know, yeah. could, could I Please. jump in there? Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm now working a lot in the book of Hebrews. I have mm-hmm. for a long time, but now I'm... Um, doing more work on it for Mm -hmm. writing purposes down the road. Um, It's interesting how he makes this distinction between the old covenant and the new, but he uses the old covenant to understand the new. It's, you know, he knows of the organic interconnection of the old covenant and the new. And then you see this particularly in chapter 11, when you see the old covenant saints knew about Christ from a distance Right. And the realities that he would bring in, they see it in their own shadowy sketches mm-hmm. that God has testified to him about. So it's that organic development, that's a really vital understanding. And I did get it from Voss. He actually uses mm-hmm. that phrase, and it's a tremendous insight, oh, yeah. but it's not new. I mean, no, it's, no, no. it's essentially the covenant theology of our confession and what Reformed people. You can, you can find, actually, statements in John Owen that you're going, wait a second, this is John Owen? That's not mm-hmm. Gerardus Foss? <laughs> right. It's interesting, um, I preached through Hebrews uh, a couple of years ago, and when you're, you're preaching, you do the best you can, but you only have X amount of time in the week to, to read as much and research as much as you'd like. But um, And it's always a perennial debate as to who may have written Hebrews. And, and if, in one sense, it doesn't matter. It's the, the Lord wrote it. <laughs> Right. Someone but, says somewhere. <laughs> you, you mentioned that a couple of days ago. But it's intriguing, at least for me to think, uh, about Apollos and the description of him in Acts. And it's, uh, was it Priscilla and Aquila who uh, confronted him? I can't recall. It may be. They took him aside privately yes. to help him along in the way. But what is tremendously interesting to me about that is that he was not teaching uh, you know, the full, uh, fully revealed teaching of the New Testament, Christ crucified and raised. Um, but they took him aside and the text says they taught him more accurately. They don't say that he was, the text doesn't say he was teaching falsely. And there's something I think to that in the sense that he was teaching an Old Testament message, but it was the truth. No, he knew the baptism of John. Exactly. Which is very interesting because mm-hmm. the baptism of John, you're moving out of the new, te- out of the Old Testament into the new, but not it's a transitional. Quite. Yeah, period. but not quite. Mm-hmm. Isn't that interesting? And so while he knew that, it wasn't as if they brought him aside and said, "What you're teaching is false." Now right. you teach this rightly. They taught him right. more accurately, yeah. in a sense, oh, yeah. bringing him into the the fuller revelation. So it's right. not true versus false, but right. nice uh, true versus perfected or cons- right. more consummate. You know? Right. Yeah. yeah so who good. knows whether, you know, I, I, I just speculation, but if it, it seems to fit that if pa- Apollos were to learn those things, maybe uh, at least in the orbit of the ancient church, this, yeah. this understanding was there of organic yeah. development. Clearly. Yeah. Oh yeah. You can find it in a number of places. Amen. So I like the way you approach the, the subject. Um, because uh, after uh, an introductory chapter, which is really helpful in laying out a lot of the categories, uh, you start to devote chapters to pericopes, to, 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 you know, in some cases, whole chapters of the Bible. Um, and so we're, we're going to march through uh, a bunch of these because they, they offer, they present to us an opportunity to ask certain questions on the subject of the kingdom of God. But the first one, the first two maybe might surprise people a little bit uh, in terms of uh, we're asking questions about the kingdom of God, but you start right away in Revelation four, of course. and then Revelation yeah. five. <laughs> so it's a uh, kingdom book, <laughs> indeed it is. Uh, but but uh, in a way, now we understand this biblically, theologically. But uh, you know, help, help us understand why why start there? Why start with the the almost end in mind? You know, well, if I could step back for yeah. just a tiny bit, mm-hmm. when I started, I thought I would do kind of a standard work where you basically are doing systematic right. theology and yeah. surveying the topic of the kingdom of God. Well, I do that badly. So <laughs> you just have to know what you do well, and this is what I do well. I have some grasp for the systematic ideas, but I rely on my colleagues to do the better presentation of mm-hmm. system. So 
I'm an exegete. It's what I do. I, uh-huh. I interpret texts in detail. That's, mm-hmm. that's my skill and what I've worked on all my mm-hmm. adult life. Uh, so I did passages mm-hmm. because that's what I do and what I have to offer to people. And I felt like, well, it might be useful because you can see that I'm not pulling this rabbit out of the hat, but mm-hmm. deriving it from the text. And you, and you really have to start with Re- with Revelation one one and proceed carefully up to chapter four. We didn't have time in a quick popular presentation in a fun book. In a fun book. <laughs> <laughs> so we start, you know, uh, chapters four and five of Revelation are a unit. You, there really should not be a chapter division, in my opinion. It should be, you know, part one, part A, and part B. Mm-hmm. Uh, they belong or together. Um, so doing them in two chapters was simply a nod to the fact that they are separable, but they're connected. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the first one you see God, it's really a survey of the Old Testament. You see the, you see the father seated on the throne and he rules forever. And there's never any contest over his sovereignty and his rule. And he will bring his purpose to, to an end. Mm-hmm. So when he makes that promise in Genesis 3.15 that he's going to bring in the destruction of the serpent and bring in the uh, victory of the seed of the woman, mm-hmm. that's he's going to you know bring in the enmity that results in uh, the kingdom of God. You see that in mm-hmm. Revelation 4, but you don't see the conquest yet. You don't see the victory yet. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's when chapter five opens with this wonderful call to th- through the three realms in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. So the three realms of creation. And there's no one found worthy. So you're taken back in time before Christ ascended. Then you have the one place in the scripture where Christ immediately after the ascension walks into the presence of God. That's, you don't have presentations of that. I, I like to say in the book of Acts, you see the disciples waving to Jesus as he goes to heaven. Bye, come back again sometime, please. Yeah. You know, but he goes away wow. and he disappears. Now what happens? <laughs> well, you open to Revelation 5. Mm. That shows you what then happened immediately. And what happens is he assumes all rule over all creation. In picture language, of of a vision but that's what you have in chapter five a really important presentation of christ assuming kingship Mm -hmm. and along those lines you know he is the one who's worthy to open the scrolls right um but you you make a point to to ask why must jesus earn his kingship why is that an important feature? It's Act of obedience of Christ. Yeah. That's, that's the systematic terminology for that concept. And this is the stuff of it. Mm-hmm. This is where the scripture upholds that terminology in our system. Here's the raw material from which we derive that systematic. Term. He has earned the right to take that scroll. Mm. And notice he takes the scroll. It's not given to him. Mm. He takes the scroll. It's the only time where somebody takes something in the book of Revelation. It's always given otherwise. There was given to him this. There was given to him that. But he takes it from the hand of the one seated on the throne. Yeah. And you're going, you just don't walk up to the throne and grab stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right. But he's worthy. He can. Uh-huh. He he deserves it. Mm-hmm. He deserves that rule that that represents. Because a scroll really represents his right to rule history in conquest. Wow. So that's the act of obedience of Christ. Mm-hmm. And then it's it and then we get a song. So here's where your classics background helps. Yeah. Because in in the ancient plays and all sorts of plays, either the tragedies or the comedies, the chorus comes out and sings a song to explain what's happening. That's what we get in Revelation. We get people singing a song to explain to us the the significance of what just happened. And you have this song that says, you are worthy to take the scroll because you paid with your own blood for some from every tribe, nation, uh, people group, and language group. This is, his conquest is his self-sacrifice, his pouring out his blood to purchase people. Mm-hmm. Uh, so redemptive purchase. Wow. And, and, and now you have citizens of the kingdom of heaven, mm-hmm. the new creation who couldn't be there otherwise. 
Yeah, that then you bring in quite naturally on that point, First uh, Corinthians fifteen, and start to speak of Christ as the first fruits of the greater harvest. Uh, in his resurrection, he isn't. We shouldn't think of that as an isolated event. Now it's unique to him because of his works. He is the one who is raised from the dead. Acts two twenty four. Death could not contain him. He earned it, but he did it. Uh, as a federal head, a covenant representative on behalf of his people, such that we will be the remaining and, and the fullness of the harvest following after him. How is that? How does as that notion of first fruits, et, et cetera, um, develop the kingdom theme? And and not just that theme, but the other themes that we see in First Corinthians fifteen. As preface, I thought. I could write a whole book on First Corinthians 15, and I mean a bigger book than yeah. this one. I love that. I'm chapter. sure you know that. I mean, it's, oh, just, yeah. it's one of my favorite chapters. You, you look at this and you're going, "Oh, I got to look at this first for a couple of days now," because <laughs> right. it's just so rich. Yeah. Um, so, in Paul's argument, he says, "You can't deny the resurrection of believers because that necessitates." you know, through good and necessary inference, denying Christ's resurrection. Mm -hmm. So people could say, no, Christ was raised. That's nice for him, but we won't be raised. And he, and Paul says, you can't hold that because we're connected. Mm -hmm. How are we connected? He gives two statements, first fruit and, and Adam, second Adam. So as an Adam all dies, so also in Christ all be made alive that they're connected. Mm -hmm. And so if you deny the one, you necessarily deny the other. And then where he's going, and this is why it's so important in this connection to talk about that chapter is in verse 50, for flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And, And that which is corruptible cannot take on incorruptibility. Yeah. You have to become incorruptible to enter the kingdom of heaven. That was always a sticking point in the f- church I formerly attended, which was a dispensational church. And I kept bringing that up because I was struggling with this and having convers- charitable conversations with the pastor. And they said, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom right. of God. And in the dispensational model, there's a mixture of right. resurrected people and non-resurrected people yeah. in the kingdom of God. Resurrections to enter into that imperative. That, that <laughs> this is why you look at that and right. you say, how is Paul defining the kingdom of God? It's new creation right. with resurrection at the heart. And so you can see you resurrection read that. Resurrection of the inner man and then? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Because right. the resurrection of the inner man is the first stage mm-hmm. in this age mm-hmm. that we experience of our citizenship in the kingdom of God in the new creation. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, that's absolutely one of my favorite chapters. Even the the statement that's a bit uh, perplexing, um, where Paul says, "If there is the natural, then there is, or there must be the spiritual." There seems to be at least uh, an implicit eschatology or telos to Adam as created that it must go that way. Oh, that's, I think that's a yeah. demonstration of this view we talked about mm-hmm. that held out to Adam is new creation yeah. consummation Consummate life if he had passed right. the test and then the that, second and last adam does it yeah that te- <laughs> that text demonstrates that that's a biblical teaching yeah amen now john chapter three uh, is another important chapter uh that's uh, where our, our friend nicodemus comes to the lord at night and starts asking him some questions and is very perplexed, uh, troubled by some of the answers, isn't understanding what Jesus is saying. If that was the first time I heard those things, I'm certain I wouldn't understand what Jesus is talking about either. We live on this side of uh, church history and with the assistance of the Holy Spirit. So praise God for that. But how does John 3 indicate to us uh, how the kingdom is inaugurated in this age and, and also what aspects await still consummation? Yeah, he's really... He, Jesus is really saying the same thing Paul just told us in First Corinthians mm-hmm. 15, that you have to enter into the kingdom of God through a supernatural birth. Mm-hmm. It, you can't enter into it in your natural state. And it's translated born again. That's fine. 
but the term is unusual. And then Jesus is playing on that term. Nicodemus hears it as again, and Jesus says, yes, it's again because it's from above. And then he brings in the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So now you see the Holy Spirit is directly involved in bringing the new creation into fulfillment. And it begins in individuals who receive birth from above through the Spirit yeah. that Jesus is now inaugurating in an overt way. The Old Testament saints were born again through the Spirit. Amen. Uh, in the same way as we are, but it was less overt and clear. Mm -hmm. Now you have a clarity that is going on. And yeah, and also a, a new covenantal administration. So the Holy Spirit's active and present in a way that we see in Galatians, for example. He's the promised inheritance. And uh, I don't know your, your take in, on Hebrews. I had a very uh, fruitful and fun conversation with, uh, with Dr. Van Drunen and uh, in between services in the Lord's Day. And I've also been talking a lot with a, a good friend of mine, Marcus Minninger, who's, who's recently been doing some work in Hebrews. But um, it seems to me that uh, in Hebrews 6, for example, you have the Israelites who have now been brought from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. Um, but yet... Uh, they're unhappy with it <laughs> and then want to go back, you know, as the Israelites did in the wilderness, they grumbled and wanted to go back to Egypt. They've been given the, the gift of the Holy Spirit yeah. and brought into this new covenant era, but uh, grumble uh, in effect. And um, just the tremendous privilege that we have to have that Holy Spirit. Or uh, again, Romans 7, this is a contentious <laughs> interpretation there, but building on a lot of what the previous colleague of yours, Dennis Johnson wrote uh, on Romans 7 and David brought up, the, the question there is, is what, what does the Holy Spirit enable? My personal interpretation of 7, 7 through 25 is that struggle is not primarily about whether, or the question isn't primarily whether he's regenerate or not, but you have an, an old covenant Jew who does not have that Holy Spirit assistance as, as a new covenant age would. And so... I know there's a lot of dimensions there, and I know all that's con uh, debatable, uh, but uh, to think of the Holy Spirit's role within the life of the believer and the dynamics between Old and New Covenant really, and the kingdom, really interesting. I think, I, think you, I think you can see wherever the Holy Spirit is active, you have new creational work going on. Yeah. And that's an important starting point. Uh -huh. So going back to 1 Corinthians 15... You know, the the natural comes first. Paul, the term natural is actually a, derived from Adam became a living being. Mm -hmm. Same word for, you know, being. And then he uses an adjective form mm -hmm. of that. So that he's playing on the fact in his original... They're, yeah, and in, 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 in Greek, it's sukikos. Right, he sukikos. became a living suke. And, and then pneumatikos is spiritual, mm -hmm. in the sense of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that, now, because that's the realm of new creation. Amen. He has, and that's resurrection for us. Mm -hmm. So if you're born from above through the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. your resurrection is guaranteed mm -hmm. because there is a start of it, not in your body, but in your inner self. Mm -hmm. This is, now you go all... You go to those places in Paul, like Ephesians 4, um, that you have, you've put off your old man and put on the new man. It's a new mm -hmm. creation uh, statement. Mm -hmm. You're part of a new human race mm -hmm. in the second Adam, and we're being made in his image, remade. And that has a moral effect now in sanctification. We are renewed in his image to obey him and follow the law. Mm -hmm. But in the end of the day, it will result in our resurrection of the body because it's a part of the new creation in our midst. This is why if you have someone who claims to be a Christian and shows no evidence of sanctification, they have to because we're a new creation. We're new creatures. Yeah, it, in, in all of us, there are days, we have bad days <laughs> where our sanctification isn't much in evidence. Right. But it's, it's a... It's a fact that we have to yeah. repent and turn back and commit again to following the Lord and obeying Him. Mm. 
Yeah, that's right. and that's and that's a fruit of the spirit. Amen. Galatians five, you know, Romans eight, yeah, five through six, yeah. you know, four through six. And it's because mm-hmm. you know Second Corinthians five, we're yeah. part of we're new creatures. Yeah. This is re- this is true of us through kind of uh, kaditseos. There I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Doctor Gaffin nailed that one into my brain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In Acts and Paul. Of course he did. Yeah, we love he's that. He's reformed. Of course he did. Amen. <laughs> yeah, he ought to. Uh, he's being faithful. Um, Matthew 5, of course, uh, is a part of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, I always love to ask my kids, now, now uh, where was this sermon delivered? You know, and they, they think for a while, oh, on a mountain. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, but that's uh, where um, we find specifically in 5, the, the famous uh, passage of the, the Beatitudes, blessed are statements. Um, how do those statements, how did the Beatitudes show us both what kingdom citizens are like, but also what is promised to them? Uh, the the likeness is throughout the eight beatitudes. You know, here's here's what his citizenry are like. Mm. You'll notice that he doesn't say mighty men of valor with good sword skills, <laughs> um, which is what they were expecting. You know, they they sign up with Jesus, the Messiah, to bring in the kingdom of God. Yeah. Some people thought that meant drive the Romans out, and that means we better mm. start working on our our military weaponry. And even Peter evidences that at at Jesus' betrayal. Still. Don't get me going. (laughs) Because you don't whack off somebody's ear if you know what you're doing. Those swords are meant for stabbing, not blindly waving around. (laughs) But that's another story. That's true. That's my first century coming out. Indeed. Um, So in Matthew 5, he starts by declaring that we have the citizen ship in the kingdom of God now. He grants it. These are beatitudes are a pronouncement of blessing. They're not exhortations. They're often preached mm-hmm. as exhortations, but they shouldn't be, I don't think. Or, yeah, formulations. If you do this, then you will get this right. kind of thing. Right. Those follow. <laughs> right. It, so exhortations follow. If you want them, just keep reading chapter five <laughs> right. and six and seven. So which is good. I mean we're, we are to receive exhortations. Uh, to follow the Lord. Mm. But those are not them. That's a pronouncement. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's a statement. And the opposite of it is a curse. So it is a pronouncement, and he grants it. And that's the starting point. Mm. You obey Jesus because you are a citizen, Mm -hmm. and he's been granted that to you. Mm -hmm. He he doesn't clarify how all that works yet because it's rooted in the cross. But that will come. This is the foundation, though, that comes. Then he consoles them, because if they imagine the kingdom of God is going to come in a great rush and the consummation in their lifetime, he's saying, it's not going to come in your lifetime. You're going to still be grieving, for example. This is where it can't be an exhortation. Blessed are those who are grieving. They will be comforted. You're not being exhorted to grieve. You're going to grieve. You're, that's not an exhortation. Uh, uh, but instead, a consolation. Yes, mm-hmm. you're going to live your life with a veil of tears surrounding mm-hmm. you and, and painful grief. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't mean the kingdom of God has failed. You will be comforted. It's the consummation. Right. That's where you will be comforted. So yeah. I was working with that and trying to show both the inaugurated form mm-hmm. and the, the stuff that's ahead of us so that we shouldn't lose heart. Because that's a constant concern of Christ that we not lose heart. You could say the book of Revelation really is about that. Yeah. It's, it's showing us his rule and not losing heart. Yeah, even in the face of uh, horrific right. circumstances right. in the ancient church. Yeah. You know, you'd, you'd and the raised, modern church. Well, yeah. Yeah. It continues. But uh, sometimes we yeah. always think we're living in the worst of it. But Right. <laughs> right. Good point. Yeah. Thank well, you. But it, it, we're in the same redemptive historical era. Yeah. No different. That's right. And... If you think that the kingdom of God being inaugurated removes all temptation mm-hmm. or uh, persecution. trials, mm-hmm. persecution, then you read the Beatitudes that, no, you will be persecuted like the prophets of old because they were persecuted for my name's sake too. Mm. When Jesus says that, you're going, wait a second, the prophets were persecuted for Jesus' name? Right. Yeah, that's what he says. And then, <laughs> then the apostles were 
rejoicing that they were found and counted yeah. worthy. Yeah, I have asked you. <laughs> for this. <laughs> you know, we, we only have a few minutes uh, remaining because we're on a bit of a tight schedule. But, um, you know, you do have two chapters on covenant and kingdom. And you just raised um, the language of, of curse. We're speaking of the Beatitudes and the blessings. Uh, but you also, in the covenantal section, start to speak about um, a self-maledictory oath. And what is the significance of the covenant being made with a self-maledictory oath in light of these kingdom considerations? It's God takes the oath upon himself. You see it Mm -hmm. foreshadowed in the smoking pot in Abraham's dream in Genesis. Smoking pot moving through the cut animals. Mm -hmm. That, That means if I fail in fulfilling my word, my promise, may I be cut in half like right. these animals. And that's the self-malediction. You're taking mm-hmm. a curse upon yourself if you fail to keep your the terms of this solemnly bound covenantal right. promise. So God takes upon himself the, the, the uh, oath. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, I do talk about Hebrews 7, a very prominent place where that's taught that the oath in Psalm 110.4 is the oath of the new covenant. Mm. And it's God swearing to the Son Mm -hmm. that the Son's high priestly ministry will forever be effective. Mm -hmm. And that's the new covenant oath. There's no other oath taken in history for the new covenant being inaugurated. Like, for example, you, you could have expected uh, the disciples to be rounded up and walked through you know, split animals, and they were not because mm-hmm. the that's not what this covenant is. It's not mm-hmm. them as the primary parties. Christ is the primary party. He right. came into the world as the covenant keeper and mediator. Mm-hmm. So that being the case, now we have. It's. It, I didn't do it in this book. It's. I actually kept myself to a page limit. Um, too bad. It's good to have discipline. Too bad. I guess there's <laughs> got to be a second volume. <laughs> you start looking at the uh, Lord's Supper passage. Oh, yes. Yeah. And you know, the word, the, the uh, language of remembrance is a covenant act. Mm-hmm. So do this in remembrance of me. Mm-hmm. That's a covenant re- mm-hmm. remembrance. Yeah, not just a recollection, but a... Right. You know, this is a public right. covenantal act. And so the Lord's Supper is how we... After baptism, it's how we now engage in a covenantal act. We're not initiating the covenant, but we are uh, performing a public act of of recommitting to our Lord, who is our covenant keeper. Mm. So it's a, a very rich act when you have the Lord's Supper, mm-hmm. and that's the background of it. Amen. Well, this has been tremendous. I feel like we only just oh, yeah. got going, started. We'll have <laughs> yeah. to continue the conversation, perhaps uh, also do another where we could talk about Ephesians. But I do want people to, to know the book, The Majesty on High, uh, Introduction to the Kingdom of God in the New Testament. It was just published in 2017. It's available. We'll have links to it in uh, the episode description where you can go get a copy yourself. Thanks so much for taking the Thank time you. today, Steve. It's been Thank a pleasure. Thank you very much. Well, uh, people can check us out online at uh, reformedforum.org, but we also want you to visit uh, Westminster Seminary, California, WSCAL.edu. Uh, and if you're smart and live in the Midwest uh, like I do, uh, take a look at their conference uh, next January because <laughs> you can get out here uh, where it's nice and, and warm. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of great information and in, uh, about uh, upcoming events and uh, other things that the faculty are doing here and information about Uh, about the school itself if you'd like to come or visit. Uh, But I do want to thank everybody for listening, and we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.